How do you write a successful academic book proposal? Stick around and let's talk about it today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up everybody, my name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do take a moment to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell to get notifications every time we post new content. Also be sure to comment below because we do always love to hear from you and all about your experiences, particularly in the case of today on book proposal writing and any experiences that you may have had. And you can follow us at these social media accounts. So today we're going to be talking about best practices for preparing an academic book proposal. You have to have a proposal to be able to get a book contract and once you have it you're going to send it to an action editor at whatever publishing houses you're interested in working with. Now for me some of my dream publishing houses within the field of psychology are places like Wiley, Rutledge, Oxford University Press, Blackwell, the list goes on. Those are kind of my personal favorites and there's other out there like Springer and you know you name it. Depending on what field you're in, there's going to be different publishers who are kind of the leaders. And one of the best things you can do is go onto a resource like Google Books, take a look at other books that are similar to the ones that you're interested in publishing, or at least are in the same field, and look at who's publishing them. And there's going to be certain trends and patterns that you identify over time. So this way you can make a short list of the different publishing houses you're interested in submitting to. Now, by and large, most of these publishing houses have pretty similar requirements requests in terms of different ways to put your proposal together. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to walk you through two actual book proposals that I developed which resulted in these two different books getting published. And they're from really good publishers within the field of psychology. Uh, the first one was this one in terms of the order I'm going to go through. So this is International Perspectives on Violence Risk Assessment uh, and this is published by Oxford University Press a few years ago. Then my most recent uh, book is by Wiley Blackwell. Uh, this book is Handbook of Recidivism Risk Need Assessment Tools. Now, both of these are handbooks. That's how I prepared them. Uh, they can be used in specialized seminar classes, which is how they're being used right now, as well as resource books for professionals uh, in my old field, which was forensic mental health, forensic psychology, where my expertise was on this idea of predicting future criminality or forensic risk assessment. So this video is going to be a little bit different than others in the series insofar as you'll still hear me, but instead of seeing me, you're going to see my screen on my computer, which is sitting right down there right now. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this process as we go through and as I tell you exactly what I did for these different proposals. And hopefully you can get some good information that you can use in preparing your own. All right, everyone, so let's take a look at these book proposals uh, for those two handbooks, which I showed you just a moment ago. Uh, the first proposal I'm going to show you uh, was prepared as part of a book series for an organization called the American Psychology Law Society, also known as the APLS. The name of that book, again, was the International, or is International Perspectives on Violence Risk Assessment. And for a book series, you have a book series editor who's the person that I was addressing this letter to, this proposal to. As you can see, I wrote it on the official letterhead for uh, my faculty affiliation at the time, which was actually a government agency that I was working for in Switzerland. I made it clear this, that this was for a specific book series as opposed to uh, kind of a general submission to an action editor at the journal, have the proposed title. So it's always good to be able to start uh, with a kind of upbeat with an introduction. So I just said here, it's a pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to submit to you this proposal for a new text in the APLS book series published by Oxford University Press. It's my sincerest hope 
to have the chance to work with your outstanding organization and to contribute to its reputation of excellence in quality and content. Okay, nice little opening. Now we get to parts that you're going to see in every book proposal. Okay, let me break it down for you in general. Okay, so the first paragraph essentially is going to establish uh, why it is that the topic area that your book is going to focus on is important in general. Okay, this is kind of the big opener, so you're going to start very general. So, for example, my book is on international perspectives on violence risk assessment. First big thing I need to do is why the heck should anybody care about this topic? So, let's take a look. So, with interpersonal violence currently a leading cause of death, the world's prison population over 10 million, and the number of inpatient beds in forensic psychiatric hospitals on the rise, establishing valid and reliable methods of identifying individuals who will commit violent acts is an important global health and safety issue. So notice a few things. Notice how I focus really on, on international numbers, right? So leading cause of death, and then I cite World Health Organization, big one, right? World's prison population, and then I give a big number, whoa, over 10 million. And then the number of inpatient psychiatric beds is on the rise. These are all big, big, big epidemiological publications, meaning that they focus on big data. Uh, and that's critical to be able to establish that the work that you're talking about, it's not something where only tiny little publications with 100 or 200 participants are, you know, uh, published on this topic. No, this is a really big deal, especially if I'm writing a book on something international and I've got that even in the title of the book, super important. So now people will read that and get the sense of, wow, I guess, you know, violence is a big problem. The second is one approach to identifying future offenders is through the use of risk assessment. Notice how I used italics because it's a field specific term. And then I define it. Unstructured and structured methods of predicting the likelihood of antisocial behavior. Okay, now I've defined the term. Take me further. While unstructured clinical judgments of dangerousness remain common in practice, numerous structured risk assessment instruments, the manuals of which claim high rates of reliability and predictive validity, have been introduced in recent decades. Okay, great. So basically Basically what I've said is violence is an issue, so it's important to identify the folks who are going to be violent. And one of the ways to do that is through using these structured instruments. So tell me about the structured instruments. The investigation of these measures, psychometric properties, has produced a sizable literature. However, this literature has largely been circumscribed to North America, Western Europe, and Australia. Terrific. So now I know there's a big research literature. And without a big research literature, why the heck should there be a book synthesizing it, right? But now we talk about the limitation, which is that the literature is mostly in these Western uh, countries, right? Or sorry, these uh, Western uh, continents, right? So now let's hop on to uh, the next paragraph. Here we go. Albeit the psychometric literature on violence risk assessment is geographically confined to a few Western regions, notice the callback to the preceding paragraph that links these two together, the largest survey in the history of the field, the International Risk Survey, uh, covering 44 countries and investigating the practical application of violence risk assessment methods has recently made clear that violence risk assessment is a global phenomenon. Boom. Okay, so this is linking the last paragraph to this one and setting up what we're going to be talking about in this paragraph, which is the international state of the art. This said, the current crop of texts on forensic mental health does not offer an international focus. And then all of a sudden you're going to see, boom, look how many references. You may say, jeez, Jay, I've never seen something like that. Well, what we're doing here is we're showing that we've done the competitive market analysis for the publisher already. These are all of the texts which are on forensic mental health assessment, but essentially have the major limitation of not having an international focus. So every time you write a book proposal, you're going to have to identify the potential competitors for your book that the publisher is gonna to have to compete with. And so you need to do that work. Take a look though that I haven't referenced anything before the year 2000, right? Right now at the time of making this video, it's 2019. And when I submitted this, I think it was 2015 or 2016. And so because of that, I was focused really on the last 10 to 15 years of books and really focused on the ones that were within uh, the niche of forensic mental health assessment, not, let's say, psychological assessment in general. Uh, I really wanted to provide the publisher with information that they could use in making their decision. So, 
keep going. To date, no texts have been published on jurisdictional differences in local research bases, clinical guidelines, and relevant legal statutes. This is important because uh, in the book, every chapter uh, that focuses on a different country is going to tackle these three things. What's the local research base? What are the local clinical guidelines? And what are the local relevant legal statutes? So I'm setting that up because they're gonna see it later. Hence, researchers, clinicians, and policymakers, very important because notice how I'm going, boom, research bases, researchers. Clinical guidelines, clinicians. Relevant legal studies, policymakers. I've got that nice parallel structure. Interested in getting involved in these regions currently do not have available to them contextual overviews uh, in a number of under-researched regions. The proposed edited text, okay, so now I've established the problem and how there's nothing else to compete with it, really. So now, what is my text going to do? The proposed text seeks to address this gap with chapters authored by leading clinical researchers in geographic regions mostly underrepresented, but of great interest in the current violence risk assessment literature. In short, as the field becomes rapidly more international, we could lead the way. Now, this is very hokey, and I wouldn't recommend ever saying something like that in a publication, like an article, but this is fine for a book proposal because part of what you're doing is making the case to the publisher that, remember, these guys are selling your book for money. They wanna make money. You gotta make it clear to them that you know this book is gonna be really unique, that you know there's really no competition for exactly the kind of book that there is, is and that it's going to make a seminal contribution to the literature because otherwise why the heck should they publish it right so now they know what the goal of the book is okay and then we got to talk about what I'm going to provide them in this proposal please find and close a proposed chapter outline and a sample chapter structure for deliverables and I'll show you those in a minute the text would begin so now literally what I'm uh, what I'm providing here um, and because this paragraph, even though it's not strictly necessary, it is outlining in a narrative fashion the table of contents which we're going to see on the next page, okay? So let's take a look at this here, right? So uh, for example, uh, the first section is all about international challenges in risk assessment, then the IRIS, the international pieces, then the IRIS, which is that big survey, uh, practices by country, and then we're going to close it with like an afterword and an appendix, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at how I do that. The text will begin by introducing the topic of violence risk assessment, systematically review previous surveys of practitioners, and then present the IRIS methodology. Boom, that's section number one. Next, subsequent chapters would then provide a primer on the current state of violence risk assessment, including an overview of relevant legal statutes, influential clinical cases in the domain, recent research on the topic of risk assessment, and clinical practices. Right, And then you see in parentheses, I'm kind of clarifying those things. And then authors will incorporate data from the IRIS to substantiate claims about current practices. Next, similar overviews will be provided for geographic regions not targeted by the IRIS. And finally, there's a set of chapters on specific topics relevant to international violence risk assessment. Boom, just a narrative version of the table of contents. Finally, you're always going to have to provide the information in this bulleted list and this bulleted list. The first one is who are your target audiences for the book, okay? Uh, really rack your brain, try to come up with a concise list but a comprehensive list because obviously you don't want your book to only be of interest to a tiny little group of people because the book publisher is gonna come back and say, listen, this really isn't worth our money, our investment in the book because we're not gonna sell a bunch and they wanna make money. You know, their business. So target audiences for the book include mental health professionals, and then I start flushing it out, right? So psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, case managers, providing or using forensic mental health assessments. The second is legal professionals, attorneys, judges, paralegals. The next is public hospitals, public community-based agencies, and private companies providing forensic services and offering training, that's a big one, to those in the fields of forensic psychology, forensic psychiatry, and forensic social work. Clinical administrators directing programs that provide forensic services. Graduate or advanced undergraduate courses in psych, soc, criminal justice, law, or criminology psychiatry residents and fellows, and psychology interns and postdoctoral fellows, and consumers who are evaluated in legal context. So also people who are actually being evaluated, right? Uh, who the tools are being used on, 
Okay, and then, so that's, you know, who the people are going to be, but then you also got to talk about what you're going to provide them at the end of the day. So usually you got to say how many manuscript pages there are, right, how many chapters, how many total pages of text, how many pages of references, how many uh, pages of figures, pages of tables, how many pages of appendices that you're estimating, and then you got to say what you're uh, estimating would be the first draft delivery date, what are the dates you're going to be editing those first drafts, uh, the final draft delivery date, uh, and once you've got those final drafts, looking through those, and then a proposed final delivery date of the final uh, you know, versions of everything to the publisher. Okay, so the key thing here is that how did I kind of come up with this? Right? I didn't do a good job of this with the first book because I, I essentially, again, these are all estimates. The reason I say I didn't do a good job is that uh, I really was trying to be way too specific in terms of the number of pages. Uh, now, one of the big reasons I did this, though, is that a couple of the different chapters, right, um, uh, they had already been published in a peer-reviewed uh, journal. So I, of course, got, had to have permission from those journals to republish the stuff, which I got. But for these, you know, I already had, you know, I knew it was going to be 18 pages. I knew there would be three pages of tables, blah, blah, blah. But you got to make estimates for every chapter how long they're going to be. And as you can see, sometimes I had 15 pages sometimes 14. You'll see in the second book proposal, it was a lot cleaner. Uh, this whole thing was much cleaner in terms of how many pages and all, uh, and the breakdown of them. Sometimes they even want to know how many words you're estimating. Now, again, these are all estimates, everything is flexible, but you, you know, you can't have a man, you know, 200 manuscript pages. That's not a book, right? You do need something that's going to be, you know, you know girthy, enough, as it were, you know, long enough to be able to justify, you know, a, an actual book, right? Uh, and so finally, the way I close is it's my sincere hope that the text will become the go-to resource for researchers, clinicians, and policymakers. Again, you see that triplet interested in international, again, I say international, standards of practice and violence risk assessment, the considerable current interest in the included underrepresented geographic regions, leading me to believe that the book is timely, always a good thing to say, and could be well-read and a promising earner, good to say, for Oxford University Press. Thank you for your considerations. Best wishes include your signature and then your info, your contact details, okay? So that's the proposal itself, but then we've got the actual, you know, content here. So make a table in MS Word, you know, I block out the sections with a little black bar in between to make it look pretty. And then uh, in terms of the columns that I have, uh, different publishers are going to request different information. Uh, usually they'll have some kind of a checklist. I'm gonna show you Rutledge's in uh, a few minutes. Um, but, uh, and these are all proposals, right? This is the section that I'm suggesting this be called, the chapters that I'm proposing. These are the lead authors that I proposed. At least half of these ended up changing. Um, but at the time, this is who I thought would be a good fit. And then I have the number of pages kind of double spaced here, right? Usually you'll submit things in terms of the page count as double spaced, okay? So. Uh, there you go, right? You've got these different sections and some of them are just really loosely titled. Some are really fancy in terms of the titles and some of them, like this is Practices by Country, you know, in the finished book, the titles of the chapters were, you know, more kind of, uh, you know, flushed out like this one, but initially I was trying to keep it simple. And I did include not only the name of the scholar, but also their, their degree and their email address. Um, I've never had a case where, you know, the publisher reaches out to them um, and then finally we've got an afterword, which I thought was important, and then also having an appendix. Uh, and uh, you'll notice here, so chapter will be based on a published journal article in the English language. Remember I told you that I had a few peer-reviewed publications at the time that I wanted to include in the book, and so that's where that, what that is based on, okay? Now, some publishers, like Oxford University Press, they want you to submit a sample chapter structure. So uh, this one's relevant to uh, section number three. So if we take a look at section three, right, here we go, we'd have one, two, and here we go, international practices. So this would be either by the region or by the specific country, okay, and that's what we're taking a look at here. So uh, this is, again, really loose. They just want to know that you have a general idea of what you're doing and that, uh, you know, you've really thought this through. You're not just cobbling together a proposal, okay. 
So I said we'll have an introduction section to the chapter, then there'll be an overview of the mental health and criminal justice systems in the region, and you guys can read, you guys can pause this video and read the sub bullets if you want. Uh, then there'll be a history of violence risk assessment in the region ending at present day. Then we'll talk about, and so remember, okay, this is research, okay? Uh, then we're going to be talking about, you know, clinical work, and legal stuff is going to be kind of driven throughout. Okay, so um, current perspectives then on violence risk assessment in the region. Okay, so this is the history and this is what's going on now. And then future directions in the region. So, okay, we have the history, we got what's going on now, and we've got what's going to happen next. And, and this is really, I would argue, one of the most important parts of the chapter. And then you've got a conclusion. Okay. And as I've said here, findings from, you know, this IRIS uh, are going, uh, study are going to be incorporated throughout uh, each one of the chapters, okay? Uh, and then finally, I've got a couple of sample chapter abstracts. So this is literally the abstract, just like an abstract of, uh, of a peer-reviewed paper, which is giving them a sense of what the different chapters are going to be about and giving them a sense that we've not only really thought about this, but we have a lot of awesome content that we can submit. So I chose samples from, uh, from two chapters that I thought were going to be two of the best of the book. And, you know, this proposal got accepted right off the bat uh, by Oxford University Press, which is a leading academic publisher. So that was, uh, you know, a sign that we had done things correctly in this regard, okay? And finally, you want to have a reference section uh, for the, the proposal itself, everything you cited above, like for example, that massive list of, of references of different books. And you want to make sure that it is, that it is in whatever your field standard references, referencing style. So for example, for me, it's the APA style, so American Psychological Association style. Really be careful with this. Go through and make sure everything's perfect. If you can't even get it right in the proposal, why should they trust that you're going to do a high quality job on the book? Okay, and uh, any formatting that's important, like for us, we have this thing called hanging indents. That's really important, okay? So uh, that is uh, proposal number one. Okay, so now let's take a look at book proposal number two. Now this book proposal, as you can see, is uh, uh, you know not as fancy insofar as it doesn't have uh, at the very top the letterhead. Again, that's optional. You could do it if you wanted. Um, for, for this one, you can see again, I got book proposal uh, underlined, I've got the proposed name of the book. Uh, the book's name did change slightly. It ended up being a uh, handbook of recidivism risk needs assessment tools. So that did change, so you don't have to worry too much about if you do want to change the, the title slightly down the, down the line. You'll also notice that when I submitted it, I don't have that first paragraph on the book series and these things, because this wasn't submitted to a book series, this was just submitted to the, you know, the psychology action editor in the psychology book series um, at Wiley, and then it was accepted. So, one of the things that you're going to notice is that there's gonna be a lot of overlap because the uh, the book first book proposal on this one both have to do with this field of risk assessment tools. And because of that, even though I had to update my numbers and my search and these sorts of things, um, a lot of the information that uh, I used for the first book proposal, I was able to use in the second one as well to the same effect. And this book proposal got accepted really quite quickly, like within one to two weeks, which is like unheard of, especially by a really good academic publisher. Um, so uh, again, you're going to get better book proposals over time yourself. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Again, you're going to see a lot of overlap with the first one, but obviously we're going to be tailoring it to the book itself. So here we go. With the world's prison population over 10 million, sound familiar? The number of inpatient beds in forensic psychiatric hospitals on the rise, sound familiar? New thing now. And rates of recidivism at over 50%. And then I use, again, I'm not using an individual tiny study, I'm using a big national um, study, so Bureau of Justice Statistics 2014. Um, establishing valid and reliable methods of identifying offenders who will recidivate is an important global health and safety issue. One approach to identifying future offenders is through the use of risk-need assessment, unstructured and structured methods of predicting the likelihood of antisocial behavior. While unstructured clinical judgments of dangerousness remain common in practice, numerous structured risk-need assessment tools, the manuals of which claim high rates of reliability and validity, have been introduced in recent decades. Now you'll notice the reference that I used is a reference 
reference that, even though the sentence is similar to the one I used in the first proposal, is very different, okay, for, for this, which is uh, this Demoray and Sing. The reason I use Demoray and Sing, and I am the Sing in this one, uh, is because uh, this is a publication specifically on recidivism risk need assessment tools. It's not violence risk assessment, it is the specific kind of risk assessment that this book is going to cover. So I, I am tailoring not only the sentences, but also the references to the proposal, okay? Now the second paragraph, again, is going to be similar. The investigation of the psychometric properties of risk need assessment tools has produced a sizable literature in academic journals with over a hundred peer-reviewed articles being published per year, which is crazy. And again, it's establishing that this is a huge topic with the big research literature. And that means that a lot of people will be interested, meaning more people will buy the book. This said, the current crop of texts on forensic mental health assessment does not include a handbook focusing on these tools. And again, I did up update this search, but it is pretty much the exact same one um, from the previous proposal. Okay. The closest text concerns violence risk assessment tools, Otto and Douglas 2010, only one chapter in which is devoted to a recidivism risk need uh, assessment tool. Hence researchers, clinicians, and policymakers interested in incorporating one of the many available recidivism risk need assessment tools are left to rely on anecdotal evidence or search the abundant literature for hints as to which instrument to adopt. And this was the key thing about this book. Every chapter pretty much is about a different tool that's out there and reviews its research base, you know, where it's being used right now, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so that what this was a really key thing is to talk about, you know, which tool do I use, da, 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 how do I make that determination, okay? The proposed edited text seeks to address this gap with chapters authored by the developers of six, uh, sorry, of leading risk need assessment tools. With risk assessment tools currently being used in over 44 countries on six continents, which is a finding from the previous book, there is a clear audience for this text. And as the field becomes rapidly more international, we could lead the way, again, from the previous proposal. Uh, writing a book proposal is like writing a grant proposal. What you'll see is that if you look at grant proposals from the same research teams, so much of his uh, overlap, it's wild. Okay, and you're going to find that in book proposals too. Please find enclosed a proposed table of contents and a sample chapter structure for deliverables. The text will be divided into four sections. Again, I won't read the sections out here, uh, but these different sections, when you read them, are going to map onto the sections that we'll see in a moment in the table of contents, just like before, okay? Again, just like you saw previously, here's the target audiences, and here's the proposed timeline for the deliverables. Now, you may say, Jay, in the last one, it was much rounder. It's 400 manuscript pages. Now, it's only 377. Okay, now, why is that? Well, as you're going to see later on, it's a lot more clean in terms of, you know, me writing out how many pages will be in each chapter, how many uh, pa estimated pages of references, tables and figures, etc. Okay, so you're going to see that. And then again, you've got this closing paragraph, which is, it's our sincere hope that the text will become the go-to resource for, again, those three populations, researchers, clinicians, and policymakers interested in recidivism risk needs assessment. The considerable current interest in this topic leads us to believe the book is timely and could be well-read and a promising earner for Wiley. Boom, done, okay? Uh, as you'll notice, I don't have the whole like signature line and these sorts of things. The reason for this is that when I submitted this to Wiley, um, they did not uh, request that I put that information in number two, but also they made me have, I believe, some kind of a cover page where I had all of my contact details and such. Okay, so here's the table of contents. All right, table of contents, again, split into these different sections, the names of the chapters. Now, this one was unique because for the, for the previous book, I didn't have lead authors confirmed. For this one, I had them confirmed before I actually submitted, and this was one of the reasons we had such a rapid approval process, is that they saw who the, uh, the authors were, and they were like, oh my gosh, these are, these are the big guns here, right? 
And then again, remember I said it was so much cleaner? Well look, it's like always 23 pages, always two pages of tables, three pages of references, and this is like throughout the section. And then I've got a conclusion section here about future directions, that's shorter, and same thing with a foreword which is shorter. Uh, the wonderful colleague who wrote the foreword for us specifically said he wanted his to be shorter. Uh, he's in incredibly busy as were all the authors, so I wanted to be sure to uh, to help him out on that. Then I have the sample chapter abstracts. Uh, you'll notice in this one I don't have um, kind of a, a specific breakdown of things, but that's because that wasn't requested by the publisher. Okay, And then I've got all the references, same thing. So that's the book proposal. Again, you're going to see all those parallels, right? Uh, and I'm working on another book proposal right now, actually, which I'll maybe talk to you guys about in a future video. If you're interested, you can let me know in the comments on this video below, and I'll do that for you. But here's Rutledge's current checklist as of 2019, okay? And here you go. They want you to include this information, and you'll notice Notice that a lot of it is covered in the proposals I just showed you, but there are going to be unique things for every publisher, and I want you to take that into consideration. I've certainly had to uh, to make some some changes to my proposal formatting and add a lot of new things based on what is uh, requested by Rutledge uh, as I submit this new book proposal with my colleagues. So let's take a look. They want a synopsis of the content of the proposed book, at least a couple of paragraphs. Okay, so I locked that down for my previous proposals, as you know. Rationale for the book. For whom is it written? What need will it fulfill? Okay, we did those. What competition is there and evidence supporting this? And obviously here you want information like the book title author, publisher, year of publication, the price. I had to go back and look at pricing information for my new book that I'm proposing. Okay, And a brief explanation of why your proposed book is better. They also want a list of contents with as much detail as possible, uh, including the contributors, so the, uh, the chapter authors, right? And keep in mind, this kind of information we already had, right, in our table of contents, in the MS Word table we had constructed, okay? Chapter by chapter outline, summarizing the content of each chapter, the, and key references. This was something unique I hadn't had to do for previous book proposals that I did have to do for Rutledge, uh, which is the proposal that I'm now working on, which is a new one. Um, so we actually had, for each, we had 15 chapters in, uh, in the proposal, and we had to write uh, uh, you know, an abstract for each of them, as well as key references for each, so we picked three references for each. Uh, are there tables, diagrams, illustrations? How many? Will they need redrawing? Put that information in there. A brief paragraph outlining your current jobs. So this is like my bio and each one of the editors, if it's an edited book, or each one of the book authors, if it's an authored book. Um, you want to have that information, that bio. And look at this. This is unique. Are you active on social media? If so, please provide details like number of Twitter followers, blog hits, etc. What I did was I talked about my ResearchGate profile because I've got a ridiculous number of, of downloads, views, etc. on ResearchGate. Uh, I'm not a Twitter guy. I'm not an Instagram guy. I don't have a blog and this kind of stuff. I obviously have this channel, which I thank you guys so much for, for watching. And please make sure to subscribe and share it with your friends. Uh, but it's something where, other than that, uh, you know, I'm not one of these guys posting 30 times a day on Instagram. So focusing on ResearchGate is also very professional. You can also talk about if you have a lot of LinkedIn followers, etc., especially if you're routinely posting on LinkedIn. Okay, sample material if available. Um, so for example, things like previously published material you would want to put into the proposal. A short blurb, like 350 words you would want on the back cover of the published book. Usually that's not requested, Rutledge does. So like a marketing thing for the back of the book. And then uh, a note on the estimated length of the, pub uh, on the, of the finished manuscript in thousands of words. Remember, sometimes they're gonna ask you for words. What I would do is take a look at the number of words per page uh, on average, so on like an A4 piece of paper, standard Microsoft Word, how many words are on a double space page and just multiply that out by the number of 
pages you're anticipating. Okay, and then a note on when the uh, finished TypeScript is likely to be ready, so we do that in the proposals I've shown you. Reviewers, who do you, uh, you can nominate two or three potential proposal reviewers, because it's gonna go through a form of peer review. Okay, and they could or could not use those. Um, and if there's a very specific reason why, you can also put in opposed reviewers, people that you're like, there's a major conflict of interest. Let's say that it's somebody who is, has worked on a competing book. You don't want them to review your book proposal, obviously. You can put that in there. And finally, if you're submitting the proposal to other publishers, state which, and uh, if you're contracted to write, uh, what would uh, could be described as a competing work for another publisher, give those details. So, you know, if you're already doing multiple books at the same time, that would be relevant. Then they're going to tell you who the action editor is specifically uh, for uh, your book. And usually the person who sends this is going to be the action editor who's the best fit for your book. So there you go. Those are two proposals which were successful and you're more than welcome to be able to use the structure that I've shown you. Uh, and then this Rutledge checklist hopefully is gonna give you a sense of the kind of things uh, that people are going to be looking for, okay? Alrighty, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this special episode today. Please do take a moment to like and share this video with your colleagues, your students, and your friends. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, and I want to hear from you in the comments section below. Uh, are you thinking about preparing a book proposal? And if so, what in general is the book going to be about? What publishers are you thinking about submitting it to, and why do you think those publishers are the best fit for you? I want to hear from you in the comments below. And also let me know whether there's any topics you want us to tackle on future episodes of Navigating Academia. And finally, please do let me know whether you would like to schedule a one-on-one consultation session to be able to discuss your idea for a book and how we can work together on writing your book proposal in such a way that we can maximize the likelihood it's going to get accepted. And the way you can do that is via this website below. Signing off everyone, have a great day, and don't forget to get out there, take chances, and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.